around us are the sites of worship. For over 2,000 years, Christians have been gathering together to worship the risen Savior. That risen Savior said, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not overcome it, shall not prevail against it. Where is that church that Jesus built? We live in a society in a day and age when everything is disposable. And there are those who begin looking for the ancient faith, the unchanging faith, the faith that you see in the churches of Cappadocia, in Hagia Sophia, in Constantinople, the same church you see here at St. Elijah in Oklahoma City, that you see in Moscow in the Russian Orthodox churches there, or in Greece. We ask you now, invite you now, to join us as we begin to discover the ancient church and set out to find the church that Jesus built. I'm Subdeacon Ezra. I will be your host and lecturer for our seminars together. It is such a joy that you're part of this with us, and in order to enhance your experience as we spend our time together, I want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get this course manual that accompanies the lectures, Finding the Church that Jesus Built. This over 500-page manual has uh, outlines of each of our seminars, as well as appendix material that goes along and is coordinated with each of the seminars that will give you background information and further readings that you can do to learn more about the topic that we have just done. There's information at the bottom of the screen how you may obtain your own course manual, and I urge you to do so. It's been prepared especially for you, and I know it's going to enhance your seminar experience. It is a joy now to go to our seminar this evening. Well, let me welcome everyone to our second session of our series together of an overview of the Orthodox faith and the church. Our topic this evening is the Holy Church and the Holy Scripture. And if you have your manual, you can open it to chapter 2. Which is going to be on page 47 in your manual. The topic this evening is a brief introduction to the church, the reality of the church, and the reality of the Holy Scriptures. And I thought that just to remind us of some of what we're talking about, I might mention Thomas Jefferson's Bible and just read out of the little introduction to it by the, uh, by the editor that's presenting it. On my first reading, <clears throat> on my first reading, even to the eyes of a 10-year-old boy, Jefferson's Bible struck with the force of unexpected revelation. For instance, there was no mention of the virgin birth or the resurrection in his Bible. From my occasional bouts with Sunday school, I knew how the Jesus story was supposed to begin with angelic visitations and an immaculate conception and end with the empty tomb and ascension to heaven. Being skeptical by nature and upbringing, such miracles figured prominently in my resistance to this great story's power. For Thomas Jefferson had cut out and pasted together only those passages that made sense to him. Well, a lot of folks do that when it comes to the Bible. They take their scissors out and they scissor and paste together and construct a Bible of their own choosing. And this has happened several times in history, not just with Thomas Jefferson. And we're going to touch on a little of that this evening uh, in our time together. The, the Bible is... Uh, quite an issue in American culture. For example, here's a full page uh, out of page out of the uh, Oklahoman 
Daily Oklahoman, Bible study can get complex. Uh, describes how there are over 600 translations of the Bible in English. Just going to uh, a Bible store, bookstore, to buy a Bible can be a nightmare anymore. It's not like the good old days when you only had the King James Bible to pick from or the King James or the RSV. Now there's 600 different translations, which makes you wonder what's going on in the world of Bible translations. We'll touch on that just a little bit this evening. Uh, there's even what an article called a holy war of words, a, trying to create a gender accurate Bible between the King James and today's new international version, which was trying to be politically correct, I assume from this article, and not uh, upset anyone because it was gender neutral in the translations and so forth. So what we're going to touch on this evening is a current topic. But we're going to go look at church history and the creation of the Bible uh, in church history and how we begin to get it and so forth. So I, I mentioned all of this to us as a way of saying uh, what we're talking about, we all have walked in out of the 21st century and brought some of this with us. And we're going to begin to examine not from the 21st century, but the first century's point of view. And, and so there on page 47, there are three large uh, questions regarding the Bible that we might start with. One would be the historical question, which would involve how did we get the Bible? Where did we get it from? Who wrote it? Uh, who collected it? Why was it collected? Who agreed that this collection was the collection? And what was to be the purpose of this collection? Uh, a second major area of question that could be asked is the textual question. Which Greek version, which Greek text are we going to use? Uh, as well as then which English translation of which Greek text are we going to use? Would be questions involving what text we want to use, uh, what version. And then there's the third area, third major category of asking a question, and that's the hermeneutical question. How do we interpret what we read in the Bible? We could have a personal hermeneutic. I, well, this is what it means to me. We've all been part of those groups where we would sit there and read a verse and go around the circle and begin to say, well, I think it means this. Oh, well, I thought it meant that. And what does it personally mean? There would be those that adopt a philosophical uh, hermeneutic, uh, some sort of rational interpretation of this text, or a scientific hermeneutic based on the latest changing scientific theories. And there's also then the liturgical hermeneutic that the worship life of the church, what is, declares it to be. Uh, out of the experience of worship. So those are all arenas that need to be discussed. And let me put you at ease, we will not cover all of that this evening. We will attempt to touch the first question, the historical question, and we will maybe in part tonight hint at or touch on the second one, some textual issues, if we have time. Uh, and then in our very last session together, we will come, well, the seventh session, and in the eighth session, we will come back to some of these themes again and begin to look at that. So it's going to be part of what we're discussing all, all of our course together. So that then brings us to page 48. And I want to mention two unexamined uh, Western presuppositions that those of us in the West, we have inherited these. They're part of the air that we breathe. And they're so much part of the landscape, we don't even know they're there anymore. We don't, we're, we're accustomed to them. One is Lone Rangerism versus Collegiality, uh, which represents, if you will, the individual versus the group. The, the West is committed to rugged individualism. Uh, the heroes in the West would have been El Cid in Spain, would have been Robin Hood in England. And in the United States, uh, our mythological figure would be the Lone Ranger, symbolizing the, the rugged individual whose our identity is established by ourselves and what we accomplish. Whereas uh, in the East, 
our identity is established by the group that we are part of. We are part of a group. And our identity comes from being with the group. And we don't leave the group. Our identity is established there and we stay with the group. And even if we disagree with the direction, we're still a part of the group and we go with the group. Uh, and, and then through five years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years living with a group, our own identity is beginning to be defined and shaped as we've learned to live together and to grow together. So the, the two different approaches to life, one the individual, the other one collegiality or the group. A second unexamined presupposition is how do we establish truth? In the, in the West, I had on my suit coat all day long and had all of my markers in it, kept slapping my leg to make sure I was well armed and forgot that when I put on my cassock I didn't transfer them over. So when I went to slap my leg just then it dawned on me and we'll see if this one can write and if not at some point I'll call time out and run real quick uh, to, to get more ammunition to, to, to use tonight. Uh, I don't think I can talk and think without a marker in my hands as it were. We have scholasticism uh, in, in the West. It becomes a way of understanding things. It comes from the word for school. And scholasticism, based on having schools where you go to learn, is going to then have teachers, and it's going to have scholars, again from the word for school, we have scholars, we get the word scholarship from this and so forth. And one of the key ingredients that makes scholasticism, school system, work, one of its requirements is you have to have books. It takes books. What you're going to learn comes out of a book. And if you're going to have a book as the source of your knowledge, in order to get a book, you have to have an author. And when a person writes a book, becomes an author, they then become an authority on the subject they wrote their book about. The more books they write, the greater their stature, the more of an authority they are. In the West, then, truth is established if it comes out of a book. And in the West, we have a bias towards books. And truth is found in a book. To illustrate this a little further so I can compare it to the East, in the West if we were to say what is a tree, the first thing we would do is take a chainsaw and cut the tree down. And then we could count its rings and what would that tell us? how old the tree is. Excellent. And if you've got a fat ring, what does that tell us? Lots of rain. Lots of rain. And a skinny ring? Drought. Drought area. So that if there are 50 rings, the tree's 50 years old, and by reading backwards, we can describe the... Uh, weather history of the last 50 years based on the rings of that tree stump. Then if we took the tree that we have cut down and we stripped away its bark, we could analyze the bark structure. We could see if there had been insects in the bark. We might notice whether or not there are woodpecker holes in it where the woodpecker has come and dined on the insects. 
and then we could begin to see if there was any disease underneath the bark, if there was any evidence of lightning strikes because a limb had been burnt or broken, or there had been violent winds. We could begin to see how as we opened up the interior of the trunk area, what the inside looked like and how the nutrition of the tree flowed and uh, all of those kinds of things on out through its limbs. We could take the leaves off of our tree. We could take a very, very sharp scalpel and we could actually shave off one layer of cells, put them under the microscope, see the chlorophyll that's there and begin to speculate on photosynthesis and how light was converted by this cell into energy, uh, the sugars that were the life of the tree, etc. And then we've written this all in our manual, our lab book, so that we now know what a tree is. And most of us have never cut down a tree and counted its rings, and yet all of us know the answer because we've heard about it or taught about it out of the book from the person that did. We got the book. And so we've now, ready to leave our lab, we turn off the light and walk out of our lab knowing what a tree is. And we leave behind a pile of sawdust and a dead tree. Now that's how we learn in the West. In the East, if we were to say, what is a tree? First thing you do is go plant one. And you begin to see whether or not it needs rocky soil, sandy soil, marshy soil, good drainage soil. You begin to see, does it need partial sunlight, full sunshine, uh, sunlight, or shade? You begin to watch it as it grows year after year after year. You see how quickly it can grow. You begin to watch birds come and, and make nests in it. You watch it get large if it's a large tree. Uh, it gets big enough someday that you're able to tie a rope in it and put a board on the bottom of it. And as a little kid, you're swinging with this tree that you've planted. And it can, still it grows. You're also growing. You've, you've uh, decided that the girl that lives just down the road had make a nice companion, and you invite her to come swing in your swing. Only she can't swing on a swing that's only got a rope with a board on the bottom of it. And so you take that one down, and you get a nice two-seater port swing that you now hang from this, and you begin dating, as it were, as she sits in the swing, and you push her from behind in the shade of the tree. The day comes that the two of you decided you wanted to get married. And you get married in the church, and yet... This is such a wonderful place that you have your reception in the shade of the tree so all of your family and friends can enjoy this wonderful tree that you've planted and watched it grow up. You have children. They come along and they bring their trucks and their toys and their dolls, doll and they play in the shade of the tree. You've now constructed a hammock in the shade of the tree. And you're enjoying it. And as you're laying there, you're watching up, watching how it sways with the wind. And if it's a strong wind, you're seeing how uh, supple it is and doesn't break and so forth. And the day comes that life has passed you by and you're called on home to the Lord. And you've requested that when you die, you be buried in the shade of that tree so your family and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, when they come to pay respects to you, can enjoy the shade of that tree as they honor your memory. Now, if you were to ask that person, what is a tree, the answer is entirely different from the person who wrote about it in a lab book. I'm not trying to say that one system is better than the other system. I'm wanting you to see that there's two separate ways of learning and knowing something. Yes? Eastern learning is going to be experiential. Okay. We experience something. Uh, and to an extent that uh, when it comes to the things of religion and the things of God and the things of the heart and the things of the soul, the East will base everything based on experience, not philosophical scientific speculation. So, good. Uh, 
Okay, so th th that's just the introduction. Uh, and so somewhere along the way, either tonight or in our weeks ahead, if you kind of feel a bump that happens, or you feel like you're getting turned inside out, it's usually over these issues of individualism versus collegiality, being part of the group, or the issue of what is truth. Is it in a book, or is this the experience of the presence of God that's going to be there? So we'll, we're going to be looking at that. Now, in our time together this evening, what we want to do is we're living over here. And if I were to talk about the church, everybody's seen one. If I were to talk about the Bible, everyone owns one or has seen one. What we're wanting to do is go backwards to here. Before the crucifixion, before there was a church, before there was the Bible, we want to come back to here and begin walking forward to see how it happened. We're not going to stand over here in the 21st century and look backwards through the fog. We're actually going to jump backwards to this side of the event and begin walking forward towards the 21st century, allowing these events to emerge. And more and more, this will be our approach week after week as we begin to do this. Uh, so before there was the church and before there was the scripture, we'll make use of the documents that are available to us to do that, including the documents of the New Testament. And there we have in the middle of page 48, item number three, the church. That's where we're going to start. And in Matthew 16, 18, I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not overpower it. Now, who was speaking? Who said he would build his church? Jesus. When he builds his church, whose church will it be? God. His church, right? Good. He's not building the church for, he's not somebody else. He's building the church. I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So he says, I'm going to build my church. Now let me just ask a, a, a very basic question. Where is the church that Jesus said he would build? Where is it? It, it would seem that there are three possibilities. Let's just explore them, okay? Okay. Number one, if we went looking for it, we can't find it because he hasn't yet built it. He said, I will build my church. That's future tense. And even though it's been 2,000 years, he still hasn't done it. That's one possibility. A second possibility is he actually built his church, but he miscalculated it it wasn't strong enough, and the gates of hell destroyed it. And there's always someone trying to create it all over again because it got defeated. Or the third possibility, he actually did build his church, and it is still in existence, still functioning the same way he created it, if we would find it. Okay, so that's what we're going to do the rest of our course together, is begin to explore this church that he built and see if we can find it and if it's in the world somewhere today. And if you'll look there at the bottom of page 48 with me, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, 19 through 22, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and are of God's household, having been built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, 
Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole building, being fitted together, is growing into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together into a dwelling of God in the Spirit. It talks about that we are a building being built together, that we are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets and Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. In our society today, what is the function of a cornerstone? What does a cornerstone do for a building today? That's the ancient function. I don't know what that. I don't think that's its present function. Okay. Yes. Who the building is dedicated to, or that's one answer, and it's true. What else is what other information? It's a date that it was built is usually on it. Who it was built dedicated to. Say it again. The first stone. It, not in today's society. It's usually the last stone. It's the last thing that's put on the building. It's the cornerstone. Okay? It's going to tell you, who, if it's a federal building, what's it going to tell you? Who it was named for. The Murrah building. And then what else is that stone going to tell you? When it was built, it's going to tell you who the President of the United States was, who the senators were, it's going to tell you who the dignitaries were. It may tell you the firm that built it. So it's primarily symbolic anymore, and it gives information. It doesn't have anything to do with the physical construction of the building itself. Several of you have hinted at that meaning of the definition. But, and even today, we usually put a time capsule in them. The last thing that goes on and may be in there and... And, 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 and so forth. But originally, as some of you have already suggested, the cornerstone was very carefully made so that every one of these angles was a perfect 90 degrees, a perfect cube, perfectly square, or a rectangle, but it's a perfect angles. And then it very carefully was put in place so that it was completely level and completely vertical true when it was being done. So that once it was in place, you could take a string. What? <laughs> Sorry. Is this an important question? Hang on. You take the string and it's held on this edge and someone can get on way over here and pull the string tight while somebody else watches here and once that tight string is aligned perfectly along that edge, not coming above it, not coming out, not bent at that edge, but is perfect along that edge, you establish this corner here. And you've got a perfect straight line upon which then to build the rest of the blocks of the building. If you've ever watched brick masons lay bricks, this is exactly how it's done today. You establish the corner, establish the level string, and they go put their bricks up according to that string that is there. And so it is that the cornerstone of a building establishes the perfect horizontal dimensions of the building and also establishes the vertical dimension of the building so that this building is perfectly straight. You don't end up with a building where by the time you get to the ceiling, it's leaning out or leaning in, or this one's leaning out and this one's leaning in. You don't get a whopper job building. 
because you have built it perfectly so that this cornerstone makes all of the angles and dimensions of the building cohere together. Uh, gosh, if we built buildings like that today, what, what's the one that's advertised on television? Ocean would go out of business, see? <laughs> if, if we, and I, I'm not poking fun at Ocean. It's just trying to make a joke here to lighten us up a little. So that you build it perfect. So the function of the metaphor then, Jesus Christ is the cornerstone. What we have then with Christ as the cornerstone, he is the one who defines his own building. He is the one who makes it cohere together. He's the one that establishes the perfect vertical, the perfect horizontal of the structure. So to say Jesus is the cornerstone is not used in our modern sense that we just stick his name on something. It is not his name on something that this cornerstone does. This cornerstone builds a building that is defined and controlled by him. That's what this building... So, we have Jesus Christ as the cornerstone of his church. He is building it, and it defines itself from him and coheres in all of its dimensions to him. And then secondly, we have a foundation then that is built off of this that is an apostolic. Apostolic is the adjective form of the word apostle. Is an apostolic foundation. Uh, it says there that it's the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Prophets is a reference to what we call the Old Testament. So it's the Apostles plus the Old Testament. And often in other places it just gets abbreviated by four, by, without saying all of that to an apostolic foundation that is there. So I'm doing that to save writing time and lecture time this evening. Rather, but it's apostolic plus the Old Testament. We're going to look at that here in just a little bit. This is the foundation of the church then. It's based on Jesus Christ as the cornerstone and we have an apostolic foundation that is going to be used that is there. And then this becomes a living temple and a growing temple. And I'm on the middle of page 49 now. We've talked about the items at the top of the page. When I was in the Protestant world, the Protestant world I was in, and I think it's pretty well indicative of the Protestant world in general, we had a pretty low opinion of the apostles. Uh, let's face it, those guys were always a day late and a dollar short. They just never seem to get it. Back in the Dark Ages, there was a, uh, I'm being facetious now since we did talk about the Dark Ages last week, uh, back in the 70s, uh, there was a, a rock opera called Jesus Christ Superstar. And in that rock opera, the apostles sang a little chorus over and over through the whole opera of the story of Christ. What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. What's the buzz? Tell me what's happening. They never got it. Someone had to clue them in. And that is a pretty indicative view, a Protestant view of who the apostles were. Uh, in today's story, they would be like the donkey in Shrek 1, who's at the back going, pick me, pick me. I mean, he's, he, they're always on the outskirts, missing the action, jumping up to see what's going on. It is quite an eye-opening experience to begin to say Jesus has a church that will stand against hell with himself as the cornerstone and the apostles as his foundation. Let's look at that for just a second. There at item number C, Luke 24 and following, this is resurrection appearances of our Savior, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, this is what we call the Old Testament, he explained to them the things concerning himself in all the scriptures. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, were not our, were not our hearts burning within us while he was speaking to us on the road, 
while he was explaining the scripture to us. Now he said to them, These are my words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things which are written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. Well, let's just ask basic questions. Whose minds, who, who opened their minds? Who's doing the opening of the minds? The risen Savior. He, he's in charge of opening minds to understand the, his presence in the scriptures. Whose minds did he open? His apostles' minds. Scripture is not subject to a private, individual, personal opinion or interpretation. 2 Peter 1.20, know you not that Scripture is not subject to a private interpretation. It doesn't belong to the individual. It belongs to those that he opened his, their minds, and he didn't open it to one. He opened it to the group. The meaning of Scripture is not self-evident. Remember the story in Acts chapter 8 where Philip is translated by the Holy Spirit of God and he sees this chariot and as he approaches the chariot there's an Ethiopian in the chariot and he sees that he is reading a scroll and he says to the Ethiopian in good King James English, understandest thou what you're reading? Do you understand what you're reading? And the Ethiopian looks at Philip and says, how can I unless someone teach me? And Philip joined himself, climbed into the chariot, and he preached to him Jesus out of the book of Isaiah. Now how did he know to do that? Because our Lord had already opened the minds of the apostles to understand when you read Isaiah, it was talking about him. So you have these apostles that our Lord is one. He opens their minds to understand the meaning of the scriptures, meaning of the Old Testament. A second passage then, item D, Acts chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. The first account I composed, Theophilus. The first account, hmm, this is Acts chapter 1. I wonder what the first account was. Well, it happens to be the Gospel of Luke. It's also addressed to a man named Theophilus. So you have Luke and Acts, volume 1 and volume 2. The first account I composed, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had by the Holy Spirit given orders to the apostles whom he had chosen. Now who gave these apostles their orders? The Lord did. Now who was placed under those orders? The apostles. So not only... Do we have their minds open? But secondly, they are placed under orders. To this day, in the church, we have the holy orders. And those who receive are placed under the orders. We say they are ordained. Ordination comes from the word orders and it is to be placed under orders and we call that then the holy orders of the church that one enters into. So that these apostles then, their minds have been opened by our Lord. He has placed them under orders to carry out what he's given them to do. And then thirdly, on page 50, item number E, Matthew 28, 18 through 20. 
And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now this is normally called the Great Commission, the great sending forth of the apostles. And he's teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. The word observe in English is an interesting word. If I were to ask you this evening, how many of us, and I'm not asking for a show of hands, how many of us observed the speed limit on our way here? You would know that I didn't ask you how many of you saw a speed limit sign. The word observe doesn't mean in this situation, did you see something? It means, did you obey something? Did you practice something? So when our Lord is telling them to go forth to make disciples of all the nations, that really is the word is ethnicities, to make disciples of all ethnic groups, to baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to observe, to teach them to practice all that I commanded you. It is not enough to go and baptize people. It is not enough to go and evangelize people. We must catechize, we must teach people who come to Christ to practice the faith the way he commanded the apostles to practice the faith. And that's what the Great Commission says. It's not just to go make disciples, but to teach them to practice all that I commanded you. They are placed under orders, and they have been commanded to do it a certain way. They have been commanded to practice this a certain way. How do you know that? No matter where you went in the Roman Empire with Christianity, everyone got baptized the same way. Baptism was identical. The worship service was identical wherever they went. We'll have more to say about that in our, our time together and so forth. So there's a, a commanded to do it. It didn't matter whether it was Peter that showed up in your town or whether it was John that showed up in your town. You were going to get baptized the same way because there was one faith, one Lord, one baptism that was done as they taught those who were being converted to practice, to do it the way Jesus had commanded the apostles to be a church. And then let us look at Item F, Acts chapter 2, 14. But Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, raised his voice and declared to them, this is on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit has now come upon this great crowd of people, over 3,000 people there, and Peter stands to give a sermon, to make a speech. And Peter, taking his stand with the eleven, Notice that this was not a lone ranger popping off on the day of Pentecost. Taking his stand with the eleven, standing together, he raised his voice and declared to them, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. And then he gives the sermon, which I have omitted. It's rather lengthy. But at the end of the sermon, it says this, so then, those who had received his word were baptized, 
And there were added that day about 3,000 souls, and they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to the prayers. So you've got apostolic teaching. This is what God had, the Lord had opened their eyes to understand. So they are going to continue in the teaching. They're going to continue in fellowship, being part of the body together, part of the group. To the breaking of bread, to the Holy Eucharist, that we will explore in another session, and to the prayers. Now our English translations don't use the word the, but that's what it says in the original Greek to the prayers, to the liturgical prayers of the church. So you have apostolic teaching and you've got apostolic worship that is happening on the day of Pentecost. I have included here, because you will not find them in our English translations. Our English Bible was translated by Protestants and we'll get to that, I hope, tonight by the end of our time together. And so the Protestant Bible translates words with some political correctness to a Protestant point of view. Uh, I guess that's a nice way to put that. Uh, the word liturgy is nowhere found in a Protestant Bible. We say, well, let's go to the liturgy, and you're going, what's that? Well, that's the worship of the church. That's a funny word. Where do you find that in the Bible? Where does it say, have a liturgy? Well, in your Protestant Bible, you will not find it. But I have written down for you all of the texts where the word liturgy or roots of the word liturgy, or derivatives of the word liturgy are found. Uh, Luke, and Acts, and Romans, and Philippians, and Hebrews. We'll spend some time with Hebrews uh, later and get to do that. Let me just call attention to one of these, Acts 13, 2. You may be familiar with that, or you may have heard it uh, if you've been to an ev evangelical service, or a charismatic service, or have watched one on TBN, or one of the other networks on television. Acts 13.2 says in most English translations, And while they were ministering to the Lord, the Spirit said, Lay hands on, separate out for me Paul and Barnabas for the task that I've called them. And then they ordained them and are sent on their way for the start the first missionary journey. So while they were ministering to the Lord, and you will hear ministers today that will say to their congregations, It's time for us to minister to the Lord. And however they've come to define that, that may be everybody standing and clapping their hands, applauding God. There may be those that say, this means let's have holy dancing, and people start dancing in the aisles. This may mean let's all speak in an unknown language, and so people start speaking uh, in another language. All different ways of trying to say, hmm, I wonder what it means to minister to the Lord. How do we do that? How do we invent that since we don't know? But the word that is translated minister is the word liturgy. So it actually says, while they were in the middle of the liturgy, the Holy Spirit had them ordain Paul and Barnabas to the ministry. And they set forth then after that service to go on the missionary journey. To this very day, all ordinations being placed under orders takes place in the liturgy. Subdeacons are ordained at one location, deacons at a different location, priests at still another location, and bishops at still another location, always inside of the liturgy. It is not a special service separate from the liturgy. It is contained within the liturgy. And those parts are then inserted inside of the worship of the church together. Well, we hope to have more to say about that in in our time together. Now let me introduce uh, a term to us that is perhaps new to all of us. And so I should summarize here. He's opened their minds. He's placed them under orders. He's commanded them to, to do it. And these apostles took their stand together. Took stand together. And so when you read in Ephesians that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone and that we have an apostolic foundation, he built this apostolic foundation into them. This is not happenstance. This is not coincidence. 
He opened their minds. He's placed them under orders. He commanded them to do the stuff a certain way, a particular way, and then they took their stand together. And they all did it the way they had been commanded to do it. Wow. I get excited about this. I'm sorry, but that's just, it's incredible. Now let me introduce a new word to us. In the Greek language, it looks like this. I apologize that I've only got green, and it may be a little hard to read all the way back there. After the break, I'll bring back darker ones, okay? Paradosis, which in our alphabet translates as a P-A-R-A-D-O-S-I-S. In modern Greek, it would be pronounced parathesis. Uh, I've studied Greek in three different, two different locations, uh, plus all of our Greek friends who attend here from St. George on Wednesday nights that are helping me with modern Greek, and every place has a different pronunciation system. So whichever one you like, I probably am saying the opposite too. Parathesis would be the current way to pronounce this word, and here's what it means. Let us illustrate this. I'll take it from there, that's okay. We just saw parathesis or paradosis happening. What did we see? The passing on, the receiving and the passing on of what was handed to them. It reminds me of the baton in a relay race. Baton, isn't that a nice word? I mean, the French are just, that, that's neat. I mean, I know we've been beating them up because of Iraq and all that kind of stuff. But moving outside of that for a while, baton. We, we even have a state capital in Louisiana that's got it in its name, right? Baton Rouge. Oh, it just trips off your tongue. Baton Rouge. Aren't you glad they didn't settle in Oklahoma? Had they settled in Oklahoma, they wouldn't have called it Baton Rouge. They would have called it Red Stick, Oklahoma. It just doesn't sound the same, does it? Baton Rouge. A red Stick, Louisiana doesn't cut it either. But Baton Rouge does. So we have the baton, the stick that is there. Now, in a relay race, you usually have four people on each team. And in a, a, a race that's not being swum, but is going to be uh, run on dry land, you carry the stick, the baton. And the first runners on all teams run, and they come around and they have to hand the stick off to the second runner on their team, who then runs, who then hands it off to the third runner, who then hands it off to the last runner who competes, and the first runner of the team to get across the finish line, their team wins the relay race. Now, there are several rules about carrying the baton. First of all, you cannot drop it. If you drop the baton, you're disqualified. So you can't turn loose of it. And second of all, you can't swap it. You can't be running the race and look down and say, you know, this is one ugly stick. I wish I had a pretty stick to carry. I think I'll... Give me a can of spray paint while I'm running, paint it. Or you can't stop and say, you know, we're never going to reach the kids with this old beat up stick. We need one that's got bells and whistles. We got to figure out a way to get the kids involved in this race. Let's throw this one away and get a different one. We have to finish the race with the baton we started with. Well, that's probably a nice place for us to stop right now. And let's go have some refreshments and come back for part two in just a few minutes. Thanks. I'm glad that you are participating in this with us through the marvel of modern technology. And again, I want to remind you that this course manual, Finding the Church that Jesus Built, will enhance 
your learning experience as we do these seminars together. Again, I remind you, at the bottom of uh, the screen will be information how you can obtain your own copy. And I urge you to do so. It's been prepared especially for you and designed to go with these series so that you will have in your hands the exact guide that we're using here this evening and will be able to read on your own time the documents that we're placing and making available in people's hands. Again, we're going to take a break here. We'll be back in just a few minutes. And I know you're going to enjoy the second part of tonight's seminar. Again, we welcome you and are glad you're part of this seminar with us. Uh, it's important not to drop it, important not to swap it. We have to finish the race with the baton that we start with. And for the church, this means whatever the baton was that the Lord gave to the apostles, that's the baton we should still be running with today. Let's look at some examples where this strange word, parathesis, is found all the way through the New Testament. We'll move quickly through these so we, for the sake of time, but I want you to get a sense of what we're talking about in this baton. Matthew eleven twenty seven. 27, all things have been handed over to me by my Father. And no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Luke 1, 2, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word have handed them down to us. All of these bold prints are the word parathesis. Acts 16, 4. Now while they were passing through the cities, they were delivering the decrees which had been decided upon. Romans 6, 17. But thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching which was committed to you. 1 Corinthians 11, 2. Now I praise you because you remember me in everything and hold firmly to the traditions just as I delivered them to you. 1 Corinthians 11:23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered to you of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He appeared to Cephas then to the twelve. Let me just pause right there and say, look what we have just said. 1 Corinthians 11, 1 Corinthians 15, the very heart and soul of Christianity is the parathesis here. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered, that in the night He was betrayed, He took the bread. That's the Eucharist. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and that he was raised from the dead on the third day. I mean, Mr. Thomas Jefferson can say whatever he wants about whether he likes the resurrection, but the apostles have given us the baton. And the baton is, I have given to you what I received, that on the night he was betrayed, he took bread and broke it, and said, this is my body and this is my blood. And what I have received I have handed on to you, that he died for our sins, that he was buried, and on the third day he rose again. That is the baton we carry. I'm sorry, but this is just golly. Wow. 2 Thessalonians 2.15 So then, brethren, stand firm and hold to the traditions which you were taught, whether by word of mouth or by letter. You don't have to be taught them in a book. You can be taught them on-the-job training, how to be a Christian. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness, I'm in 2 Peter 2, than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment delivered to them. Jude 3, Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I just emphasize common salvation. That's the collegiality again. We have a common salvation. I don't have one that's different from somebody else's. It's a, it applies to me, but I have it in common with you. We have a common salvation. Uh, 
I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith, this one baton. Remember, he opened their minds, he placed them under orders, he commanded them to do it, and they took their stand together and they started the race. St. Paul said, fight the good fight. And then he could say, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I completed it. He ran his leg. And in Hebrews it says, as we're racing, that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses. Let us run and lay aside the sins which so easily beset us. Don't drop the baton. We are in the race, and this is our moment in eternity to run our lap. And the baton that we have been handed, that has been handed, that has been handed, is the baton the church must hand on to the next person in line. We cannot drop it, and we cannot swap it. Okay. Let's, let's, let's see what happens at item number C. How many times is the baton passed in the following verse? 2 Timothy 2.2. 2. Here's what it says. And the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, these entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. Now how many times was the baton passed in that verse? I heard three. Someone give me four. Let's, let's auction it up. I got four. I got four. Someone give me five. No, no, no. Question. Infinite number. Infinite number. As long as somebody doesn't drop it and somebody doesn't swap it, we've got infinite, don't we? Okay, let's just get the count that's right there. Then we can look at infinity as well. Uh, let's see. And the things which you heard from me. Who's the me? That's St. Paul. Let's see, I need a little bit of space here. St. Paul. The things that you heard from me, who's the you? That's going to be St. Timothy. What is St. Timothy to do? Teach who? Faithful men. And what are the faithful men supposed to do? Teach others. Right there we've got forerunners. The baton is passed once, twice, three times. St. Paul has said, for what I received, so we know that he didn't invent it. He didn't create this. He received a baton from the church at Antioch, trained at the church of Antioch, was sent forth by the church of Antioch. The apostles had come to Antioch. Peter was at Antioch. And we know that these others, and that's the infinity. How can we still be doing it the same way? Because it's the baton being passed. He commanded them, placed them under orders, and commanded them, teaching them to observe, to practice it the way I commanded you to do it. They were a worshiping church in Jerusalem. And they went forth from that worshiping church with that baton and created replica of worshiping churches everywhere they went. And so they went forth then, They went forth from Jerusalem to Rome. They went forth to Alexandria. They went forth, Thomas, to, to India. It did not matter where you were in A.D. 30. Everywhere they had the same faith, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. I can remember thinking many, many years ago, gosh, it would have been great to have been alive then when they had it true. See, I was a Protestant. Protestants believe the church that, that hell won, got corrupted, got destroyed, and it's up to them to reinvent it. That's why we've got 
25,000 versions of it in the United States today. Everybody's trying to reinvent it. They think it all got blown to bits by hell and destroyed it because it, it got corrupted and so forth. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. But it didn't matter if it was A.D. 30 or A.D. 100 or A.D. 1000, even though the Pope, the fifth bishop, split off from everybody else and created the Roman Catholic Church. It didn't matter if it's 2001 and we're in Oklahoma City or wherever you are, if you happen to be watching this on the DVDs, it doesn't matter where you are on this planet or what the date is. It's one faith, one Lord, one baptism. If it's the same baton that the apostles were handed by our Lord that is now being handed to you. That is an incredible story. It is the church that Jesus built that still to this day has no earthly head is still doing it the same way 2,000 years later. It has to be a miracle of God, one, that the church is still here without an earthly head to do it. Secondly, it has to be a miracle of God that the church goes into every region and adopts the language of the people. So you go to Greece, you become the Greek Orthodox Church. You go to Russia, you become the Russian Orthodox Church. You go to Bulgaria, you become the Bulgarian Russian Orthodox Church. If you go to Serbia, you become the Serbian Orthodox Church. If you go to wherever, Japan, you become the Japanese Orthodox Church. And it's the same worship service, the same faith, the same creed, the same doctrine anywhere you are on this planet. And at Pascha, our Easter, all around the world in all the languages of what are the, the people are speaking, the same sermon is given. A sermon that was preached in like 385 A.D. is preached around the world Year after year in language after... And there's no earthly head of the church. No earthly head of the church. This particular room that we're in, we are an Antiochian church. We are a branch of Antioch. I don't have Antioch up there anymore. We are a branch of... They're still in existence. That church you read about in the book of Acts, where Christians were first called Christians, is still in operation. They just bombed it out of existence in Antioch, so it moved to Damascus. And it's on the street called Straight that you read about in the book of Acts, where Paul went to get his eyesight back when Ananias baptized him. And Paul's going to go to Thessaloniki. And you read about the letter to the Thessalonians. Well, they kept passing that baton on and on and on. And that church is still there to this very day. I mean, who converted Greece? Paul? Well, no. Paul went and converted a few in Thessaloniki. And the Thessalonians and the, Thess I mean, the Thessalonians and the Corinthians, they converted the rest of Greece. And it's still there. I don't know how many churches there are in, in, in Thessaloniki. I, I got to hurry. I, this just blows me away, guys. I mean, this is wonderful. So here tonight, on our Wednesday night program, you're going to have members of an Antiochian parish. You're going to have members of St. George Greek Orthodox Parish. We've got the priest from St. Mary's Ukrainian Orthodox Church all here tonight teaching. Now, I want you to know something. There's very few places you could get. I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Baptists since I was a Baptist. It'd be very hard to get at random five Baptist ministers to come and teach in somebody else's church all at the same time. I mean, it, we just don't agree. We're too cantankerous. I just, you know, you, you understand what I'm trying to say. Without an earthly head, how does this happen? Because Christ is the head of the church. Upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Okay, now. A byproduct of the church being the church is things did get written. Letters got written. 
Worship services eventually get written. But we've just talked about 2,000 years of the church passing the baton, and we haven't even mentioned the New Testament yet. Wow. We will talk a whole bunch about the New Testament in our last session together. But I should tell you that uh, the church can be the church and has been the church without a New Testament for 2,000 years. Now, we have the New Testament, but let's find out how we got one. That's why we're on the top then on page 53. Let's talk about the counterfeit church for just a moment. A man named Marcion in A.D. 145, and he was the son of a bishop. Bishops were married in those early days before the great eras of persecution happened. And Marcion, I don't know whether he was anti-Semitic or what his beef was, but he decided that everything that was Jewish must be thrown out. He came to the conclusion that the God mentioned in the Old Testament was not the Father of Jesus Christ. Was not God the Father of the New Testament? Well, there was no New Testament yet. It's not even written. He says that the God of Christians is not the same God as the God of the Jews. And so he throws out anything that is Jewish. He throws out the entire Septuagint, the Old Testament of the church, throws it away. He throws out all of the apostles as his foundation. Now that ought to make you shudder. Makes me want to stand over here when that lightning bolt zaps, you know? But he's got to have a foundation. What's he going to do? And Marcion created an idea, had an idea that he's now going to, he's innovative. I will create a book, and I will let the book be my new foundation. He's really a man of the West, isn't he? He needs a book. And he goes, okay, what am I going to use for my book? Well, and he, he starts kind of going through Christian writings. There's a, he runs into the Gospel of John, Man, that won't work, even though he talks about he's a little rough on the Jews. He's a Jew himself, so that's not going to work. And then he comes to James, the Lord's brother. No, he likes Jesus, but he doesn't like James. Mark? Mark hung around with all those guys, one of them. Letters of Clement? No, he's with them too. Ignatius, for crying out loud, we can't have him in the deal. The did okay, even though it's the teaching of the 12 apostles? No way. Matthew, the most Jewish of all of them? Whoa. Letters of Peter? No, he's another one of those Jewish guys. Luke. Luke. Ah, probably Gentile Luke. I think I like Luke. And Marcion starts reading Luke. And, of course, Luke had hung around with the Jewish boys a little too much. And he'd, some of it rubbed off on him. So Marcion took out his pen knife and cut out all the naughty parts. He expurgated the Gospel of Luke, cleaned it up, rehabilitated it, and said, we'll use Luke. Okay, let's see. Well, how about Jude? No. Shepherd of Hermas? No. The letters of Paul. Peter was the apostle to the Jews, but Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Aha! Now, of course, Paul, he had had some contact with the Jewish guys, being Jewish himself, so Marcion has to also cut out all the naughty parts of him. Once he's cleaned up Paul, he puts the Gospel of Luke and the epistles of Paul together, created a twofold division, Gospels and epistles, put them together, and created the first New Testament in history. It never existed before Marcion. And it is the idea of a heretic. Marcion's New Testament. Now Marcion realized the minute he did this, that if it's a book, books are always subject to interpretation and misinterpretation. So therefore he could not leave that to chance. 
So he wrote his own book. And his own book is called The Antitheses of Christian Writings. Now, wow! Antitheses. We've all remember Hegel, right? Thesis, antithesis, synthesis. This side, here's the opposite. And so he's right up front saying, here's the antithesis. The instead of. You can have the Christian writings over there, or you can have the instead of. And so you take Marcion's New Testament plus Marcion's interpretation, and Marcion created the first New Testament church. I want you to hear that. People today run around and say, oh, I want to be like the New Testament church. If you want to be like the church that was there when the apostles were there, you're going to be an apostolic church. If you want to be a church built upon a book, then you are a New Testament church. Because that's what Marcion created, a church built on the book plus his interpretation. And so we have the book plus interpretation. And in Marcion's church, you, instead of an iconostasis like we have in, in, in an Orthodox church, he has the statue of Paul placed on one side of the altar and a statue of himself placed on the other side of the altar. Oh my. Yeah, oh my. See, you just want to go, whoa. It ought to cause an oh my. He created out of thin air a church by taking a few writings putting his interpretation to it, and voila. And people followed him. He got a following, got belief. I think his church existed 500 years. There were still followers 500 years later, or, or a good long time later. Now, the church, of course, responded. St. Irenaeus wrote a book called Against the Heresies. Against Heresies. And in this book, he not only defends the faith, defends the church, he's essentially saying, these are our writings, get your hands off of them. They don't belong to you, they're ours. And he defends the gospel of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. All four gospels. And he defends the writings of Paul alongside Hebrews, and Peter, and James, and the letters of John. And he then argues, since you've come up with the idea of a New Testament, we're going to use the idea. But it's going to be our book, not your book. It'll be our collection, and the purpose of this collection isn't to build a church. It's to be used as the sword against the heretics. Hence the title of his book. And so he wrote his book, Marcion is going to be condemned as a heretic. The church continues to be the church. And I should say, oh by the way, almost at 400 AD, the church finally decided to say, the, the 27 books that we had collected all these years and called our New Testament. We'll canonize that now. The official New Testament of Christianity did not exist for the first 400 years of Christianity. Individual writings existed. They were quoted. They were read. They were never the blueprint for being the church. The blueprint was Jesus Christ and what he had commanded the apostles. The baton given to them that they went out and taught every convert how to practice worship, how to practice Eucharist, how to be baptized. We all got the same baton. One faith, one Lord, one baptism. It is the church without that New Testament that converted the Roman Empire. It is the church without that New Testament 
that died being eaten alive by the lions. And it is that church without the New Testament that gave birth to Christianity around the world. Wow. Now, last week together, and I don't have time to touch on much of last week, but we started off with the church, just one church. You get to 1054, and the Bishop of Rome splits off from the church, and we've got the Roman Catholic Church as a separate church created. It has an earlier history, obviously. But from 1054 on, it's a separate church, and we have two versions of Christianity. The Orthodox is a continuation of this baton. This is a different baton that happens here. It's going to go 500 years before, in the 1500, 450 years, I guess, you began to have Martin Luther. One of the splits here, when the Pope split, was over the issue of authority. He didn't want to be part of the group. He wanted to be the head of the group. That rugged individualism begins to take over in the West. It's an issue of authority. Am I part of the group or am I on my own? Martin Luther is going to split with the Pope on the same reason, the issue of authority. And he then is going to come back and face the same situation that Marcion had faced when he takes care of this. At the time of Martin Luther, you would have had the papacy here, to which all in the West answered. Once Luther eliminates the papacy, he has to replace it with something. And he does what Marcion did. He replaces it with a book plus interpretation. The book is the Bible. He threw out the Christian Old Testament and replaced it with a version that didn't get completed until 1500 A.D., or 1400, it was only 100 years old by the time he used it. The Masoretic text, we'll talk about this in our last session together. This has never been the Old Testament of the church, but Luther makes this the Old Testament of his Bible. He then adds to it the 27 books of the New Testament. He wanted to throw out the book of James and the book of Revelation, but didn't, and he created his book with only 39 books in the Old Testament rather than 49 or 46 or whatever, and the 27 New Testament books, and the first Protestant Bible was created. Soon to follow was going to be the birth of the Anglican Church in England, under King Henry in the 1500s, fully developed under Queen Elizabeth I. And in 1603, she will turn, die, and in, in the leadership passes to her nephew, James VI of Scotland, who becomes James I of England. 1607, the first permanent American colony in North America is created and named for him Jamestown. And in 1611, he will authorize the first English translation of the Bible into English known as the King James Version. And in the 1611 translation of the Bible, the King James Bible has the church's Old Testament, all 49 books, plus the thir uh, 27 books of the New Testament. It was only later, under the influence of the full Protestant Reformation, that the 
Protestant book of Martin Luther will win the day and subsequent printings, subsequent editions of the King James will throw out the church's Old Testament and will follow the new Old Testament of Martin Luther. So what you have is throwing out the authority of the church and replacing it with a book. Now, of course, he faced the same situation that Marcion had faced. <clears throat> People are going to read it and they'll interpret it for themselves. We can't have that. So if you have Luther, I'm sorry, let's do it this way. Let's take the New Testament plus Luther and what church do we get? That's a Lutheran church. If you take Zwingli, the other, one of the other major leaders, and take the New Testament, plus Zwingli, who was in Zurich, was an Anabaptist, you're going to get Baptist. If you take the New Testament plus John Calvin, who's in Geneva, you're going to get Calvinism. He didn't really create his own church. He just infected every church. Well, sorry. We'll have more to say about his, what he's done later. But if you take the New Testament plus John Knox, who took Calvin, took Calvinism to Scotland, and he created the Church of Scotland, which is the Presbyterian Church. I don't know how to spell Presbyterian. Presbyterian Church. And of course, if you take the New Testament plus I'm Henry VIII, I am, you're going to get the Church of England, the Anglican Church. And if you take the New Testament plus John Wesley, you're going to get a Wesleyan church, but it doesn't go by that name because when he came to the United States and was part of the first great awakening in this country, he hit upon a cookie cutter approach, one, two, three, that you could get people saved. You could have instantaneous evangelism if you followed this recipe. He called his recipe the methods. And everybody that grabbed his methods and went out and followed the methods were called Methodist. Now, he never became one. He, he, he died still an Anglican and was buried in Anglican at his funeral. Church history is fun, isn't it? Golly, don't you just love this stuff? Uh, and on and on and on and on and on. Now, I'm not here as a hired gun. I'm not trying to shoot. But you take the book plus somebody's interpretation, and that's what we get to. So finally, you get to us in 2001, and you say, I think I'll just stay home and read it for myself. Well, you'll be a congregation of one. Why not? What's the difference? I mean, who do you pick? Well, I like Oral Roberts. Well, I like Pat Robertson. Well, I like Jerry Falwell. Well, I like Charles Stanley. Hey, on and on and on and on. Everybody's reading the Bible plus someone's interpretation, either their own or what they're picking up off TBN or the radio, or maybe they're more honest by saying, I'm going to go play golf. I don't know. But it, you see where we are. Once we get here, so that there's 26,000 or 35,000, they multiply so fast, versions. There's a, a big sign on the road over here, a billboard. It's got the name of some new church that's meeting in uh, an X movie theater, and whatever the name of it is, and then it says, with accented letters, designed with you in mind. The church of what's happening now. I mean, wow. Forget the baton. Let's take a public opinion poll, find out what you want, and we'll give it to you, all in the name of Jesus. Well, I'm having a little fun. But you get the message of what I'm talking about. So, 
All right, let's see. If I run out of time tonight, getting close. Let me... Yeah. If you'll turn your, onto your book to page 55, and you'll have to turn it sideways because it's printed sideways in your book. I want to re-raise some of these historical questions that we've kind of talked about. And I know this is painful because if you walked in here tonight with that as your foundation, the shaking of the foundations is happening. The same way it did when Marcion came along and threw it all out and put the two statues in. You may feel that way. You may feel like, golly, he's attacked everything I believe in. It's very painful to begin to know there is a whole different understanding of Christianity than that which we've grown up with in the West. In the West, all we have is Catholicism and Protestantism. You pay your money and takes your choice in there somewhere. And good old American atheism as a cop out in the middle of that. And it is a scary thing to bump into a version of Christianity that predates all of that that we've never even heard of. So I'm trying to make it light and humorous, but I, I take very seriously what this can feel like. And it wasn't that many years ago till I was sitting in the class similar to this, hearing this for the first time, and beginning to go, oh my goodness, can this be so? Historical questions. What kind of church was it that Jesus built? How did this church without the Bible evangelize the Roman Empire? How did this church without the Bible create such faith that they died for it? If God intended the church to be built on the Bible, why did he wait 400 years to come up with it? Why was it that the idea for a New Testament church came from a heretic who rejected the church? If God intended the church to be built on the Bible, why were the original autographs of the New Testament documents not preserved? Why is it that all of the documents comprising the New Testament were written by men who were worshiping members of the Orthodox Church? How could the church without the Bible define the nature of the Trinity for everyone? How could the church without the Bible define the dual nature of Christ for everyone? How could the church without the Bible decide what books were collected into it? And how can Protestants accept the Bible created by the Orthodox Church and reject the church that created it? Well, let me just quickly say in the little bit of time that we have left that if you do want to use the Bible for your foundation, in addition to trying to figure out what English translation you're going to use, one option would be to learn Greek and figure out what Greek version you wanted to use. And you've got some problems. Since no original ones exist, which one are you going to use? Item number two there at the bottom of that page. Does one use the Greek text established by Erasmus in 1516, whose Latin translation called the 27 new books the Novum Instrumentum, the new instrument, and was changed its title in 1518 to the Novum Testamentum, the New Testament? Or does one use the Greek text established by Westcott and Hort, the New Testament in the original Greek, published in 1881, which is based on the so-called Western text of the Alexandrian text type, which is found in only 5% of the total manuscripts? Or does one use the Greek text established by Robinson and Pierpoint, the New Testament in the original Greek, published in 1991 and based on the Byzantine text form, which comprises more than 90% of all existing manuscripts, or does one use the Nestle's Greek text, or the Greek text of, of Elisivar, Griesbach, Lachmann, Tischendorf, and all those other hard names? In other words, what Greek version of the New Testament does one use? What am I saying? This is a copy of the Greek New Testament published by the American Bible Society. Here is a different Greek New Testament based on one of these other guys, this Greek New Testament and this Greek New Testament do not agree with each other. Here is a third Greek New Testament. It doesn't agree with the first two that I've said. 
They were all done by Protestants who put these together, and they're based upon 5% of the manuscripts, the Alexandrian manuscripts, the Western manuscript. Finally, a bunch of Protestants got together and they said, this is nonsense. We need to go to the Orthodox Church because they are unchanging. They've got the text from the beginning. The extant copy doesn't exist, but they've copied it, and it's the same in all the liturgical services, wherever you go. And so they went back to the Orthodox Church using all of the uh, service texts of the church and created their version of the original, the New Testament in its original Greek, according to the Byzantine or the Orthodox worship text, which is based upon 95% of all the existing manuscripts in the world. So what are we going to pick? We've got a choice. Now, let me just show you why all that is an issue. And in, in the essence of time, if you will turn to page uh, 58 and turn it sideways. This is as far as we're going to get to go this evening. I will try to honor our commitment on time together. What you have on page 58, where it says example B, this is the first page of the Gospel of John in the, in the uh, American Bible Society's trend of Greek New Testament. I should tell you quickly that if you were to take a course in Greek, uh, Biblical Greek, Koine Greek, you always start with the letters of John and the Gospel of John because it's the easiest Greek there is to learn. The vocabulary is easier, the syntax is easier, the repetition of words is easier. It is the easiest Greek to learn and almost every Greek class that's Biblical Greek starts, your examples are going to be out of the letters of John and the Gospel of John. So this is where you start. On that page, if you look down below verse 6, you will see a horizontal line running across the page. Everyone sees the horizontal line. Then, underneath that, it looks like footnotes. It's got 3 through 4 and a whole bunch of stuff. What's below the line are all of the manuscripts that disagree with what's above the line. And we're talking, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And you look across on the other page, and you get below verse 16, and it does the same thing for above it. You know, this has got John 14, 1, 14 in it. Uh, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. I mean, and all those manuscripts. Now, I'll give you one last example, and that's on the other page, 59. If you'll look at the top left-hand side, you'll see, or the top right-hand side will work, you'll see verse, chapter 7, 46 through 8, 12. And if you come down, you will see the letter numbers 52 with a square around it. See that? And it's there in Greek, and then written in, it says, example C, the lady caught in adultery. Chapter 7, verse 53 through 8, verse 11. And then you will see in a square a big 8 in verse 12. There are 12 verses missing out of the Gospel of John in this version of the Greek New Testament, the American Bible Society, the most, one of the most conservative groups in, in America when it comes to textual issues. And the episode of the lady caught in adultery is omitted. And if you follow the arrow down, then you begin to see where it says omit, and then it has all of the manuscripts or evidence that would omit this to be there. What am I saying? I am saying to you that if we try to build the church on a book, We've got great problems trying to find that book to use. And secondly, we then have to find the right interpretation to use that we're all going to agree on to be the church. Or we come back not to a book plus interpretation, 
but we come back to an apostolic foundation. Well, how do I know the apostles got it right? One, it's unchanged for 2,000 years. The architecture's unchanged for 2,000 years. The liturgy's unchanged for 2,000 years. But nobody can do it without a book. Do you know that they've discovered in the two, uh, pyramids of Egypt evidence that the Egyptian children played hopscotch? And it was played then the same way it's played here 5,000 years later. And to my knowledge, you cannot go to Toys R Us and buy a book that'll teach anybody how to do hopscotch. It's been passed down for thousands of years by children teaching the next generation how to do it. I have never seen a book on how to wash dishes. I don't know of anybody that learned to wash dishes by reading a book. We all learn because our mother taught us how to do it. The church is on the job training, receiving the baton, learning to run with that baton till it is our adult time to run with it, to train the next generation so that they too can run with it. So that one faith, one Lord, one baptism continues upon the face of the earth because upon this rock our Lord built his church and for 2,000 years the gates of hell have not prevailed against it. Thank you and we look forward to seeing you next week together. Thanks. The seminar as much as we've enjoyed it here from time to time I get a little excited but I find the things of our faith and the good news of Jesus Christ to be something worth getting excited about. I'm also excited about our course manual. And again, I want to invite you, if you've not done so already, to write down the information at the bottom of the screen and order your copy of this manual today so that you'll have a chance to follow along with us with the, the uh, seminar outlines each week and have a chance on your own to look at the material that is also located in the book. Again, let me tell you what a joy and a pleasure it is that we have spent this time together, and I look forward to being with you again for our next seminar.